Welcome to the Anachronism Podcast. I'm your host, composer Gustav Hoyer. Welcome back. So pleased you could join me for this special episode of the Anachronism Podcast. I'll be sharing today my interview with a special guest, composer Peter Boyer, and I'll share a little from his official bio. Peter Boyer is one of the most frequently performed American orchestral composers of his generation. His works have received over 500 public performances by nearly 200 orchestras and thousands of broadcasts by classical radio stations around the United States and abroad. He has conducted recordings of his music with three of the world's finest orchestras, the London Symphony Orchestra, the Philharmonia Orchestra, and the London Philharmonic Orchestra. He has received commissions from several of the most esteemed American institutions and ensembles, including the Kennedy Center for the National Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Pops, Cincinnati Pops, and the President's Own United States Marine Band. Other orchestras which have performed his music include the Philadelphia Orchestra, Cleveland Orchestra, Pittsburgh Symphony, Houston Symphony, Dallas Symphony, Nashville Symphony, and Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. His most notable work, Grammy-nominated Ellis Island, The Dream of America, includes actors and orchestra and has become one of the most performed American orchestral works of the last 15 years, with over 200 performances by more than 100 orchestras since its 2002 premiere. In 2019, Boyer received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, which is officially recognized by both houses of Congress as one of the most prestigious American awards. He has also contributed work to film and television, working with composers such as James Newton Howard, Michael Giacchino, Thomas Newman, and the late James Horner. And he's composed scores for the History Channel, Academy Awards telecasts, and short films and various other projects. All of this can be found on his website, propulsivemusic.com. Encourage you to go there, but more importantly, go check out his music on Spotify, Apple Music, or you'll hear it very often on Sirius XM. And Peter is a special guest for me because he and I were in conservatory together. I knew him uh, briefly when our paths crossed at the Hart School of Music, where we were both studying composition. So it was a special pleasure for me to reconnect with Peter after all these years and celebrate through this interview his great success and his wonderful music. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Okay, so Peter... Uh, thank you for coming on the Anachronism Podcast. It's really an honor to speak with you and uh, to have had the, the happy accident of crossing paths with you, younger, uh, a younger version of both of us, and to have seen your success yeah. through the years. I first want to just congratulate you on your fantastic work, the quality, the impact of it. Uh, just well done. And uh, again, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. And it is indeed nice to reconnect uh, over zoom if not in person after we won't even mention the number of years but quite a few years <laughs> more than a couple to be sure mm -hmm. um and so as i as we discussed i love to dive in with guests on the human heart of our art form and it's easy to uh for some to be put off by the uh, the weight the freight that comes with classical music it's long storied history the celebration of the great work that's come before sometimes right. the pretense or the ostentation of it and i think we share some similarity in that we came into classical music not as young very young children but later on in life and i recall some details of your story but i'd love to know and i'd love for you to share with the listeners what how did you enter classical music? And I put classicals in quote classical because we know it's that's a reductionist term for the quality of the art form we work in, but it's a convenient term. So how did right. you get engaged in the first place? Um, well, as always, these things are fairly big questions with long answers, but I'll give the, the relatively short version. Um, I started intensely in music when I was 15. So as you say, not you know, not a toddler, certainly not crawling over to the piano, you know, as soon as I could stand, nothing like that. Um, I played a, a little bit of guitar when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, 13. Um, and that was not a major focus of mine, you know, interested just in pop music. But at 15, um, it was some sort of a watershed moment for me in which I guess I was 
a pretty serious Billy Joel wannabe, um, which I think is actually still true today <laughs> in some uh, respects. Um, so this great love for pop music that I heard on the radio was what drove me to want to play piano and write songs and sing um, when I was 15. And uh, the short version of the story is that I asked my grandmother, my father's mother um, at that time, uh, who was kind of, she doted on me um, and had, you know, disposable income and was able to uh, get things that um, that my single mother at the moment couldn't necessarily afford. So I said, you know, I'd really like to play the piano. And uh, I guess this was no pun intended music to her ears because she had always had love for music and she wanted, uh, you know, one of her grandchildren to, um, to really take an interest in this. So uh, she actually went out and purchased me an upright piano um, and that showed up at the house just a few days later and, you know, moved in. And that was sort of the start of my love affair with the keyboard. And, uh, and I just started playing and figuring out uh, largely on my own pop songs, uh, that kind of material pretty quickly and started writing pop songs. So that was, that preceded by a couple of years the kind of moment um, that was really a, a breakthrough into classical music on a personal level. And I think, you know, you may have had a similar experience in high school. So I went to Smithfield High School in Smithfield, Rhode Island, um, you know, fine public high school, um, modest size, with a very good music teacher, a man named Robert Cleesby, who was a, a big influence at that moment. And because I had a certain amount of facility and I think a kind of fanatic interest in it at that time, I ended up... Uh, accompanying the choral groups really early on, like uh, as soon as I was there. And looking back, I don't actually know how I did that and I probably didn't do it very well, but nonetheless, um, I did it enough for that moment. <clears throat> and so in my junior year uh, of high school, which was also my last year because I skipped my senior year, uh, after basically having been immersed in music for two years, there was a, a music history course that this teacher, Robert Cleesby taught. And so that was my first really true organized exposure to, if you will, classical repertoire. Um, starting, you know, I don't even remember the, the textbook. It, it would not have been Grout, that was a college textbook, but some sort of, you know, Grout contemporary book, don't even remember what it was. <clears throat> but I recall, you know, starting with the Middle Ages <laughs> and moving forward, uh, you know, in a typical music history fashion over the course of one year in high school. And, um, so about midway through that year, uh, you know, something like January of that year, uh, we came upon the Mozart Requiem. I'm sure we must have watched Amadeus with its, you know, fictionalized but very appealing Mozart. Um, and all of that kind of coalesced and I became very interested in the Mozart Requiem and in that sort of, you know, classical era of music in general. And then right around that time, my grandmother died unexpectedly. And so uh, I was just, turning 17 at that moment. And I had the crazy notion that I would write a Requiem Mass. And so that's what I did. And it's a long story, but the next two years of my life from age you know, 17 to 19 were largely devoted to writing a Requiem Mass. And so I, I wrote a full scale 40 minute Requiem Mass, a setting of the, of the same text set by you know, Mozart and Verdi and others um, in my ambitious, you know, kind of unknowing teenage way. And I went to Providence Public Library and I took out the scores that I could find of Requiems and I took out the recordings I could find of Requiems. And it was just early in the CD era. So listening to CDs and looking at scores and trying to figure out, you know, how does one write a Requiem? And I, and I entered that, you know, that world of classical music. And I did have mentoring. Um, there was a man named Stephen Mottarella who, uh, became my piano teacher and then my independent study teacher as an undergrad at Rhode Island College. And I think he saw this highly ambitious, um, very curious, somewhat talented young guy who was pretty you know, serious about all this. And he just had a great amount of knowledge. So he steered me in a lot of right directions. Um, he was not, is not a composer, he was a great keyboard player and, and conductor. Um, so he couldn't give me the insight that a, a true composition teacher would have had, but it was a lot of insight nonetheless. Um, and so over the course of those two years, I wrote this Requiem Mass. And again, it's a long story, but uh, I managed to convince a lot of people um, in Rhode Island and specifically at Rhode Island College, including the, the president of Rhode Island College and others to support this vision that I had of actually conducting this piece. And over the course of a couple of years, 
uh, I managed to raise about twenty thousand dollars, which you know was a lot uh, at the time for a young guy, and um, managed to ultimately conduct two performances of this full-scale Requiem Mass with about 300 performers. And I had just turned 20 the month before when I actually conducted that. So it was rather grand. Um, and it got me into USA Today newspaper, this, this so-called uh, all USA college academic team that was just starting at that time. So it was a huge amount of attention, uh, you know, being literally on the front page of this special section of USA Today newspaper in January of 1990, uh, a few weeks before my piece actually premiered. Uh, all the local television stations, the local radio station, uh, Providence uh, Journal, which was the major paper, did a major story about me the day of the Requiem. So when it actually happened um, at Roberts Auditorium at Rhode Island College in my junior year, it was standing room only. That uh, this place held like a thousand and we had more than a thousand people. We were like bumping up against the fire limits <laughs> of people. So it was pretty extraordinary for you know somebody who was just turning 20 to have this sort of huge scale project and all of this attention from the community and all of this support. And of course, the human interest aspect of the story, the fact that I was this young guy and I had written it in memory of my grandmother who had died, that interested a lot of people. Um, so I got a tremendous amount of support. And when that was done, you know, when I finished conducting this 45 minute piece for this sold out standing room only audience, the tumultuous reaction after the moment of silence at the end of this piece was you know, it was like life defining, uh, like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do more of this. Um, and so that, you know, that really was the beginning and that preceded graduate school and, you know, all the things that followed. Powerful story and uh, extraordinary experience for a young man, especially uh, with the kind of background coming to classical music relatively late because classical music's defined historically and in the popular mythos that, it is the Mozart-like young prodigy that's curated from almost the time they can walk to right. these points. And for your entry, it's relatively late for that mythos, but it's not that right. it, it isn't possible. So I love the... And, the... And, and I should say before we leave that, that you know I, I possess none of the dazzling keyboard genius of Mozart or Beethoven, right? So uh, you know my, my keyboard technique, you know I could not do these dazzling things. I could play... Billy Joel and, you know, and Dan Fogelberg and Harry Chapin and these, these artists that I loved so much and Journey and all of that. So, you know, my, although I took lessons in college, um, you know, it's really only like a couple of years of formal, traditional classical piano study. And to this day, you know, I can play some somewhat and I play enough, I know it's kind of composer piano, enough to to work out my ideas now with the help of technology, et cetera. But I've never had this dazzling keyboard technique or really any kind of true formidable keyboard technique. You know, I could maybe make my way through some relatively easy Beethoven sonata movement when I was in college. And that's about the extent of it. So, you know, you would never see me sitting down to play a concerto or something like that. So I've had to kind of overcome those limitations that might not have been there if I had started when I was five or something like that, which I did not. Music is a, an immensely challenging pursuit. Playing uh, is extraordinarily demanding. Um, so prior to that moment, though, I want to go back because there, this this moment fascinates me because I had a moment like this, and I find that many people who remain passionate about classical music into uh, professional life have had a, maybe something like this. Right. The moment when you were perhaps you were in this music history class and you're listening. And and you were reared on pop music, and you had the sounds of Billy Joel and Harry Chapin, all these people in your ear, and you this, right. have this encounter with music. When was that moment when you really realized this this is my voice, this is the place where my creativity will express itself? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question, and it's a you know it's a complicated question to answer. I mean, I, I think about the impact of of hearing that repertoire, you know, specifically of hearing the Mozart recommend. And, and I, no doubt, I, you know, looking back on it, I also had to have been influenced by the story, you know, the, the, the wild story around the fact that it's his last piece and it's unfinished. And I'm sure, you know, I was influenced by seeing, you know, Amadeus and, and, and sort of taking at face value what we now know to be, you know, a pretty fictionalized version of it. I'm sure that that kind of mythology, that mythos to use the term you're using had to be a factor in it, but also, there's something of a of a grander scale of a grander kind of communication that 
such music provides that even the greatest pop music doesn't provide. Uh, the greatest pop music is absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and they're different things, obviously. And it's not in any way <clears throat> at all to denigrate, you know, great pop music. I mean, I love Billy Joel just as much as I love, you know, Beethoven. Um, but there is, there is a grandeur and there is a, uh, uh, a kind of architecture. There's something about the process of being able to create some large scale musical thing with, you know, in this case, let's say orchestra and chorus and soloists or any combination of those. Uh, there's something about that, which is part of a lineage that, you know, of course, at the time as a teenager, I was only just beginning to grasp and I'm still trying to grapple with all of that. But, you know, there's something about, let's say, for example, the orchestra um, that it, it's, it's very difficult to define. And you look at and listen to this incredible entity on a concert stage, especially at a very high level, you know, let's say something like here in LA, you know, the LA Philharmonic or Pacific Symphony or, you know, San Francisco Symphony or any number of wonderful orchestras. There's something about the communal aspect of that and that all of those people with all of that training and all of those, literally when you put it together, hundreds of thousands of hours of practice when you cumulatively put everybody on the stage together and you say, what is this, you know, hundreds of thousands, a million hours of practice together. And all of that is being focused in that given moment on bringing to life these notes that somebody put on a page. Um, that appealed to me immensely. <laughs> and it still appeals to me immensely. You know, and it, it became a kind of compulsion, you know, it's a sort of compulsion to want to try to do this. And so yes, in a larger sense, that is that is what the classical music tradition is about. But I felt drawn in by that and in a sense drawn to the challenge of trying to do that long before I had any sort of in-depth understanding about you know music history and the kinds of things that one is supposed to know in order to get a graduate degree and all of that. I mean, I was just a high school student, um, but, but something about it just really appealed to me and grabbed me um, and you know that I guess I guess that's my attempt to answer your question. It's a very big question. So uh, over the years, I've had a number of you know these kind of if you want to think of the light bulb over the head moments where you think aha you know some sort of realization dawns upon you, um, and and I have to think back to that that one as being a very early one. But you know it's not the only one, and there have been many others along the way. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, there's always, there's always something new. It's kind of cliched, right? But we go back and we can look at these great scores and learn things that we had not learned when we looked at them earlier, find things that we hadn't found before. And that's not necessarily so true about pop music, even, even a lot of great pop music. Um, maybe it is, but, uh, but there, there's, a, there's a depth to great classical works that draws us in and it feels kind of inexhaustible. And so that, that's something that, continues to pull me in to this day. So to restate what I heard, I think the scale, the the complexity, the, the coordination, the, the, the human scope of it, and maybe the technical depth of it, the being different than, than what popular music, and like you said, there is an excellence that a popular music has, but it yep. isn't. It's of a different character than than this classical tradition that really resonated with you and drew you in. A huge ambitious project to bring a choral orchestra work as your first major public activity. <laughs> how, right. how was it for you? Was there a moment early on you'd written the notes that you've now convened to the players? So this is the first consummation of that impulse. You now have those million hours on stage, or some variant of that, based on the orchestra right. you had at your disposal. Was that a particularly memorable moment? Did it fulfill, were you just filled with the wonder of it? Was there a sense that it was maybe disappointing? It was a less of a moment than you thought? Maybe talk about that when you first encountered the reality of that moment you anticipated. Right, well, that I mean, that's a, that is a very good question as well, or a series of questions, and that, you know, that varies uh, according to <laughs> the forces that you actually have in front of you. And when I think about uh, you know, to answer this specific question about the Requiem when I was so young, what I had ultimately assembled um, was a mixture of really different levels of experience. So because I had raised this money, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, I had 
a budget to actually hire a core of professional players. So that core of professional players, you know, principal string players, uh, et cetera, um, certain other, I don't remember exactly the breakdown, but uh, there were a number of pros, right? And so the pros were at a much higher level than everybody else that I had at that time, which had everything from a high school string orchestra um, up to college. I had basically recruited uh, my colleagues, my undergraduate colleagues at Rhode Island College, a number of people, you know, friends and people who I cajoled into performing. Um, so there was some of that. There were pros, there were college students, there were high school students. And then the choirs, more than one choir, um, were essentially amateur, you know, amateur, a big amateur choir, which was at that time called the Warwick Civic Chorale, which is, you know, 125 or something. And then a church choir from my uh, teacher that I mentioned, Stephen Mattarella, his church choir, plus some others. And then the four vocal soloists, soprano, mezzo-soprano, tenor, baritone, those were also pros. That was part of my budget so that I was able to do that. Um, so as this young guy, you know, like literally age 20, having just turned age 20, at the final end of the process, when I had rehearsed with the choral groups, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, was, I was learning as I was going, right? Um, and I did take conducting lessons, um, uh, you know, so I, I had had a, approximately a year worth of conducting lessons, something like that, but still, you know, an amateur, um, a young amateur, but at least I had written the music. <laughs> and so I knew how I knew how I intended it to go. So yeah, I mean, you know, I don't recall in great detail exactly what ran through my mind at, that, at those moments, but I felt like it was a culmination of a process that let me get up to those rehearsals with all of those forces. And certainly at age 20, standing there in front of approximately 300 people, you know, it's an, it's an, an awesome, in the, it's a very overused word. Awesome is an overused word. <laughs> you know, we talk about awesome for pizza, you know, but that's like awesome in the traditional sense of here I've worked at that point nearly three years, actually over three years to that moment to make that thing happen. Uh, and here it is beginning to happen. And you've got to react to that, um, to take it in, to try to absorb it and obviously try to enjoy it, but also to then do your job, which is to try to make it better uh, within the scope of the rehearsal. So all of those thoughts, you know, I, I recall going through my mind. And if I can just sort of jump ahead because it's relevant, you know, jump way ahead. When I think about, for example, my last recording in London, which was recorded in, in 2013 and released in 2014, you know, I, I, I have done one recording each in London with the London Symphony Orchestra, the Philharmonic Orchestra, and the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Right? So these are among the very, very best orchestras in the world. And in each of those cases, but the one that I'm talking about is, is in 2013, uh, you know, I had written my first symphony, which was commissioned by the, the Pasadena Symphony here uh, close to where I live. And that had been premiered publicly and had been um, quite successful. But this was a few months later and I was in London. So I've written this 24 minute symphony that I spent a year writing and uh, you know, very difficult uh, process to write that piece. Uh, and the, the third movement of the symphony is, is a, it's a three movement symphony and it's an adagio, it's an 11 minute adagio. Uh, it's very melodic, it's very tonal. And I remember at Abbey Road, you know, conducting the read through, the read through of this 11 minute movement, no stops, just the read through with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Now I had conducted the Pasadena Symphony a few months before, a very good orchestra, um, but this was the London Philharmonic Orchestra and this was at Abbey Road. <laughs> and I just remember, you know, in the climaxes being totally blown away by the greatness of what I was hearing, that it was so absolutely splendid that I was, I was, you know, fighting back tears because it was so emotional to hear these, and they're just reading it, but they're so good that it sounds phenomenally good. Uh, and I just remember thinking, you know, <laughs> like I have to savor this moment because this is going to be one of the best moments of my life. But I also can't like totally lose myself and forget to do what I was supposed to do as a conductor. I remember that very clearly. And I, you know, getting to the end, it was a read through, you know, it was good enough to go on a recording and just this huge cutoff at the end and the sound reverberating for a few seconds at Abbey Road. And I, I, I probably was in tears. And I just remember thinking, you know, wow, wow. Right. This is like, this is as good as it gets as a composer. I mean, this is how great it can be. Okay, so now let's like take a deep breath and go back and actually work on it and try to make it a little bit better. So in a way that is a kind of sequel to that moment back there at age 20, if that makes sense. It's a kind of a sequel. Um, 
you know, it just, and it represents a certain journey, but there's also that process of what it's like when you finally get there after who knows how many hours you put in, sitting by yourself in a studio, trying to figure it out, and then finally saying, okay, I figured it out, and you get to that point. Um, you know, those are great moments for a composer, and they, they have to be earned. They really have to be earned. It's a long road to get there. Anyway, long answer to your question. <laughs> uh, I love, love that story and can relate to it uh, from some of my own experience and realizing what a gift great players are. As a composer, yes. you labor in relative solitude and you have the domain of your imagination as your reward. Right. And then when it's brought into the real world, what a powerful, even as a young person, you had pretty good resources, as you noted, but yes. you've yeah. now you've now had the privilege of working with some of the finest musicians alive in the world. And what a what an enriching experience. So that springboards to my next question, that from that first piece, huge resounding success, you've continued to, to write much more and, and share your music more. What is it that um, keeps the machine running? There, It's a lot of work, and we'll come to that part of it next, because I think right. sometimes people don't realize how really hard it is to get those <laughs> dots on the page and get them in the hands of players and all that. We'll talk about that. But today, if you were to sit down and you're going to write music today, what is in the heart of it that's made it part of the fabric of your life that has sustained you, will continue to be a part of your life? Maybe share a bit about that. Sure. I mean, and you're absolutely right that, you know, being a professional composer, it's, it's a job uh, as other jobs are. And so being a job, it requires immense dedication and immense uh, follow through. So yes, there's a, absolutely an artistic aspect to it. There's a creative aspect to it, but there's also just the work aspect to it, just like there isn't any other job. And, and it involves putting in a huge number of hours to do a thing. So um, I, one way that I'll try to answer that, again, very big question is I decided very early on that I wanted to try to be a professional composer. And by that, I wanted to try to uh, do the things that I saw professional composers do to make a living um, at it, uh, whether that was you know, the sole way of making a living or part of a suite of uh, things that allowed me to make a living, but also to... Uh, to be commissioned and to fulfill commissions, right? And so that's been a huge part of my life. Uh, at this point, I don't know, there are about 20 something, 23-ish commissions that, that I've done. Um, so something like one a year, uh, more or less. And, I, and I've tended to do, you know, medium to large scale things. So I've certainly done smaller things. I've certainly done, you know, short pieces, but um, I have done some big pieces that have taken a very, very long time to do. So the commission, whatever that commission may be, that to a large extent is what defines my task. It defines what it is that I have to do. Um, so, you know, if we just think for a couple of different examples, you know, my most well-known piece, which is Ellis Island, The Dream of America, uh, which is a 45 minute piece for actors and orchestra and projected images. I conceived that piece it was totally my idea and my conception, and I had to find an entity to actually commission it, which ended up being the Bushnell uh, Center for the Performing Arts and for the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. Um, but nonetheless, I couldn't proceed fully and totally until I actually had a commission and I had a commitment. And frankly, you know, we should not um, leave out the part of a job which is getting paid, right? Is that, is that um, you know, actually being commissioned and the way that commissions typically work is that one receives half of a commission up front when one begins and half of a commission at the end when one is done. <laughs> so that can be a year in between those two things. That can be 18 months in between those two things or, or even longer. Um, so part of the motivation is I have a commission. I have an agreement. Uh, I have a specific set of tasks. I have half of the payment for this thing. And when I get all this done and I have checked off all the boxes of all the things that I have to do and I've delivered it, I will get the second half of the payment. Um, and that is a motivator. Um, so by, by no means is it the only motivator because that would be foolish, um, but it's certainly a motivator. And it, I think it's important. So I've tried very hard to have this professional aspect be part of my life. Um, and so then I try to uh, think about what the, what the task is. And so again, these stories are all long, but I'll try to make them short. So the, the last major commission that I did um, was my first and so far only commission from the Kennedy Center uh, for the National Symphony Orchestra, 
which as we talk here at uh, on August 26, 2021, will now be performed in less than a month. But I finished that piece 20 months ago um, and delivered that piece, uh, I delivered the score at the end of December of 2019 um, and the parts at the beginning of, of January 2020, shortly before the pandemic. So that piece has been waiting a very long time for its actual public premiere. But nonetheless, um, you know, over the course of about a year, I worked on that piece. And that piece, which is called Balance of Power, which is a three movement, 18 minute piece, had a very specific, extremely challenging point of commission, which was it was commissioned by a former United States ambassador who was mentored by Henry Kissinger and wanted a piece to be uh, dedicated to Henry Kissinger and wanted a piece to have something to do with Henry Kissinger. Well, that is a hell of a difficult project for a composer. So I had to figure out what to do. And there was a tremendous amount of reading and research and thinking uh, about how I would ultimately even go about figuring out what the piece is going to be. And that's all part of the process. That's all part of the research. I mean, I read 3000 pages either by or about Henry Kissinger over the course of six or seven months as part of my research for that project. Now, I never ever would have thought that I would do a piece with that particular subject matter or that particular dedicatee, but that commission came along. And so because it came along um, and I decided uh, that I would accept that challenge, that also you know, really defined those tasks. And so over the course of 2019, I spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about this you know, very controversial political figure and what he had done and, and all of that. Um, so ultimately, you know, I, I, then I wrote this piece. Um, and every commission is some variation on that. Uh, it's some variation. It is what is the specific piece? Who are the commissioners? Uh, mostly it's been from orchestras, you know, so what does the orchestra want? Uh, does the orchestra want a celebratory piece or does the orchestra want something that reflects a certain moment? I've done pieces inspired by mythology, for example, like Three Olympians, um, string orchestra piece, and The Phoenix uh, and Ghosts of Troy. I had a sort of stage quite a while ago where I was really fascinated by mythology, still am, but was really focused on that and trying to do pieces focused on mythology. So all of these things, they help to define the task. And those are different ways of proceeding that if I simply said to myself, okay, I'm gonna get up today and I'm gonna sit down at the keyboard and I'm just gonna write anything. Um, and that's a totally different, <laughs> there's a totally different thing because it's, it's not defined. Um, and so by and large, I have written almost no music just to, if you will, amuse myself just to see if I can do it. Although I think if I had no commissions, I probably would. But, I, but mostly, most of my time over all these years has been devoted to fulfilling commissions that I've gotten and then trying to do them to the best of my ability. So I guess that's my, again, kind of long answer to your short question. That's fascinating, and uh, you know, I'm happy to to hear your answers, however long they need to be. Uh, it's, it's super interesting. So, I'll take us back to again a moment. You're you've taken on this commission, Henry Kissinger, uh, diplomat, uh, political strategist, a contentious figure, all of these things, and, and it's a person, and a memory of a person. And you say you you came up with um, its balance of power, correct? And so you had to title this work. When you sit down and not a note has been written, but it's about to, it's that pregnant moment before it's like, I'm going to put a dot on the page. I've consumed all this information about who Henry Kissinger was, his legacy, who the kind of person, take me to that moment if you can. And, and unopen that because again, folks who are not familiar with this process, uh, it's a little mystifying is how do those sounds come from that contemplation, which is all text and history and can seem very um, remote from what is ultimately, uh, especially for instrumental music, it is it's wordless emoting in structures and thoughts. And it tell us more about that. I'd love right. to know. That's a very good question. And since we're talking about this particular example, you know, which is relatively recent compared to some of his other things, uh, let me be a little more specific about what I came up with because then that really defined what what the kinds of notes would be, if you will. So, balance of power. Is is you know, and of course I wrote this piece before the events of January sixth, twenty twenty one, and uh, and before you know, uh, by and large I had finished this piece, uh, you know, before, uh, no, I finished it all before the last election. I'm trying to put it all in chronology. Um, so, uh, you know, I was thinking about um, this concept of a balance of power. First of all, 
as a side note to this, good titles are really important. So if you can get a good title um, that actually, you know, it's, it, it may sound a little sort of superficial, but it's, it's actually a very helpful thing. If you know what your title is, um, it can help define things in a kind of uh, amorphous way. And so balance of power, you know, my reading about all that, you know, I read this book, Diplomacy by Henry Kissinger, which is 900 pages and took me months to read, and, and another book called World Order, um, and I read two biographies of him. And this idea of a balance of power, the struggle uh, and an e a sense of an equilibrium of power between great um, nations, nation states, et cetera. I mean, it's an amazing sort of concept. Um, and so that title, okay, that helped define an overall vision for what this piece might be. Also, um, I should tell you the three titles of the three movements because they're important. The first movement is called A Sense of History. The second movement is called A Sense of Humor. And the third movement is called A Sense of Direction. And it took me a while to find that. And that helped define things to, to a very large extent. And so in this particular case, and this is going to sound a little crazy, but it's true. Um, when I accepted this commission, uh, I was flown to New York from LA by the woman who commissioned the piece, Bonnie McElveen Hunter, and had lunch with Henry Kissinger. Okay, so this is an odd thing for a composer to be saying that I had lunch with, with uh, you know, the aged and wise uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger and his wife, Mrs. Kissinger, and uh, this woman, Bonnie McElveen Hunter, and Deborah Rudder, the president of, of the Kennedy Center. So it was a totally surreal moment. I mean, surreal is another overused word, but it's a really surreal moment. I think I'm about to have lunch with, you know, the man who helped for example, open China to the West after decades of isolation. You know, this is very important. And again, frankly, very controversial figure. Um, in the course of that lunch meeting, uh, when we actually discussed what this piece might be after a lot of other preliminary things, and I was asked to talk a little bit about Ellis Island, the Dream of America, because Henry Kissinger was, uh, you know, was an immigrant who came to the United States um, when he was a teenager from Germany. Uh, all of which is interesting and kind of tangentially related to my piece, Ellis Island. But apart from that, um, when, the, when we actually got in this conversation around to talking about the fact that this piece was going to be written and I was the one who was going to write it, oddly enough, um, there were only two things that he actually said to me in this lunch. Um, and I thought, you know, okay, if Henry Kissinger is going to say something about what he might, you know, want or imagine in this abstract sense, I'm going to pay attention. And the first thing he said was, <clears throat> I won't imitate his voice, but it's a very famous low voice with a deep, you know, German accent. He said, <clears throat> please don't make it too abstract so I can understand it. Uh, and of course, he doesn't know my music and, you know, he might very well think as a contemporary composer, maybe I'm given to wild abstract music, which I'm not. Um, so that one was easy. And then shortly after that, he said, quote, could it be a humorous symphony, unquote, um, which... <laughs> You know, is again a pretty wild thing to contemplate because this is a man who is renowned for his humor and his wit, or certainly he was in his day. Um, so I made a mental note about that. Okay, humor has to be part of it, but it certainly can't be the whole thing. Um, so the second movement of this piece uh, is called A Sense of Humor, and the subtitle is called Scherzo Politico, which when I hit upon that, I thought was that was a great subtitle. Um, and essentially, this, the second movement is a kind of sardonic scherzo so we have the whole history of you know scherzo movements and symphonies and other pieces to draw upon and also because i knew that i wanted to reflect his famously low growly voice i decided to write a duet in the middle of this scherzo for contrabassoon and bass clarinet which is something i've never done before and i probably will never do again um, but it, it turned out to be the right thing for that movement right so that was that was like a piece of it but you know thinking about this idea of balance of power and of the great struggles of, of powers throughout history, uh, you know, all throughout history to this day, then obviously that had to be music that, you know, that's not humorous. That has to, that has to have gravitas, that has to have some strife, that has to have some darkness. Um, you know, so that helped define what that movement, which is the biggest movement, was going to be. And then this idea of a sense of direction, uh, that's a phrase that I found in a number of pages uh, of Kissinger's writings. And he was essentially expressing admiration for leaders who had a sense of direction and contrasting them with leaders who didn't. And uh, I wanted and needed, I felt, to, uh, to end this piece in an optimistic way. For one thing, because it's supposed to be you know, a celebratory piece for 
Henry Kissinger's 95th birthday, you know, it could, the piece could not end on a big, you know, down note. It had to have something uplifting and I had to have a reason to be uplifting. And so when I thought of this, a sense of direction, okay, and I'll think about that kind of metaphorically as something that will allow us to be optimistic about our future, about the future of this country. Um, and, and again, this was before things were as you know dire as they have been over the last uh, 20 months in this country, uh, because the piece was, was written before that, before the pandemic and, and before these unprecedented um, struggles. And, but nonetheless, I wanted to be optimistic. So with all of that in mind, right, I have a, I have a kind of framework. So now all that is to, to answer your question. So now I have to sit down and figure that out <laughs> and figure out what this is going to be. Um, so for this sense of history, I thought, you know, I needed to write some sort of theme that somehow evokes history. Well, that's extremely subjective, but it has to be, it seems to me, it has to be lyrical. It has to be, in this case, somewhat somber in nature. Um, it has to have a memorable character to it. And, and then there has to be music that is driving and that really suggests conflict and battle, you know, this, uh, this kind of sense of history. It has to have those qualities. So, you know, as with any piece, then I sit down at the keyboard and I start writing notes. I start, I start playing notes and often what very the what happens at the very beginning is there's some sort of an improvisation and that improvisation either gets rejected or it gets accepted and if it gets accepted you know i'm the one who's doing the accepting then i then i continue to refine it and and that is basically how i come up with a theme we come up with musical themes and so a big part for me at the beginning of the process is trying to craft themes thematic material that I think is compelling, that I think is appropriate, and that is not a theme that somebody else wrote, right? which is one of the hardest things to do because we, you know, we composers and conductors and musicians, we have so many tunes in our heads, right? We have, we have so much material in our brains, including some of the greatest melodic and thematic material ever written. Uh, so, you know, we can't do that. And so, you know, you can't write a theme that, that is the same as Beethoven wrote or, you know, John Williams wrote or Ravel wrote or whatever. Um, but yet, you know, we still have just the same 12 notes, assuming we're talking, you know, not microtonal music or something. So, you know, this is the challenge is to, is to create this material and it can take quite a long time. Um, and so, for example, in the scherzo, I knew that I wanted something that would be funny, <laughs> uh, kind of off kilter. I love mixed meter stuff. I love fast, fast mixed meter stuff. There's a lot of that in my music. Um, I've written a lot of stuff that's in seven, eight or five, eight. So I wrote a seven, eight scherzo, you know, and a lot of, in this particular case, you know, themes that just kind of go up and go down really fast and don't really go anywhere. Um, and I came up with a kind of sardonic, a quasi D minor, you know, theme, uh, for this second movement. And then for the third movement, a, a, a sense of direction, I wanted to have something that would, you know, in a way I envisioned a kind of motor driving us forward. And so I, you know, just tried to find a harmony, a chord that would give me a sense of that this is, I can build something optimistic on this. And let me just repeat that. Let me repeat that chord. And you get a pulsating pattern that then is the basis for that, you know, how that starts. So, you know, that's how these things start, but they take a very, 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 very long time to, to get into their, into their final forms. Um, you know, like I said, I worked on that piece for about nine months. So, um, you know, nine months to research and write 18 minutes of music in three movements for a large orchestra. Um, so that's not terribly fast. And of course, doing other things as well, but, you know, largely focusing on that. Um, okay, so that was a really long answer to your question, but that, that's, that's how that started in that case. And kind of every piece is some variation on what I've just described. As you consider that process, and that's, it's, interesting to take human experience through the filter of the composer's life and they become notes and that journey that expression and how hard it is to bring that in a novel way that is your own voice that's authentic to your experience it's not just simply a restatement of things that have informed you that have inspired you that's immensely right. difficult but the hard work doesn't stop once the notes are on the page because as you've described there's a whole business part that helps bring this music into life and that's hard work too. And I don't know uh, if you want to share any of that, but you mentioned the commission and the mechanics of that, doing the research. I'd just love to know the full journey so that um, 
what it takes, it's not enough to just put notes on a page. They eventually have to be in front of musicians, with an audience. All of this stuff has to come together for the musical experience to occur. Care to elaborate on any of that process? Sure, no, that, that's, that's very true. Um, it's very true. You know, if one wants to be in the business of music, then one has to know something about the business of music. And uh, there has to be some, I think, combination of artistic and creative work with just good old fashioned business work and, and leg work, um, promotional work. And, uh, you know, so if one is, let's say, John Williams, um, you know, who's unique, uh, I don't think that John Williams needs to devote too much of his time to promotion and marketing of his material, um, because <laughs> I think that he's, he's John Williams. And uh, I, <clears throat> you know, he has Gorfain Schwartz agency, and he has, you know, the the film studios of the films for which he's working on, et cetera, you know, or, or he has the Boston Pops, you know, so there's a whole um, large apparatus that is in place because he is unique. Um, and, you know, there are, there are some composers who are of such a big stature that I would imagine that they don't have to devote a huge amount of time to marketing their music um, because they are so known and so in demand and so established that um, that largely is not a concern. But that represents an extremely small minority of composers. Uh, so most composers have to do the business part of it as well as the creative part of it. And it, it, it can be difficult to separate these things um, because they really are, I think they use different parts of the brain. Um, and so <clears throat> in any given week and on any given day, I tend to divide my time as far as my composing career goes between doing the creative work and doing the business work. And uh, so, you know, just, just as a, a brief example, I mean, I'm, I'm very often asked, how did I get my first orchestral performances? And, you know, how did you make it grow from there to a point where, you know, now there are so many, I'm mean, almost 600, uh, you know, <clears throat> almost 600 performances. I, by the end of the season, it, uh, it'll be 600 and, uh, you know, 200 some orchestras involved. So obviously it all, you know, it all had to start somewhere. Um, and part of that answer is that I was fortunate that when I was very young and just starting that, you know, when you're very young, there are lots of competitions that you can enter. Um, this, this becomes much less the case as you uh, pass a certain age point, but when you're, you know, when you're in your, your teens and your twenties, uh, you know, there's a proliferation of opportunities, uh, to, to just simply apply to things. So, you know, early on, uh, you know, I won the BMI Student, Student Composer Award twice, um, once while I was at Hart and once right after I left Hart. That was, you know, because that is a, a, a pretty coveted um, prize and it's, you know, many, many, many um, applicants and only a relatively uh, small number of winners, you know, six, seven, eight, something like that. That certainly gets one's name out there. I mean, as far as being a composer, I, I, I did in fact have, you know, the luxury, if you will, of having my name out there as a very young composer because of this USA Today thing that I described to you. But that was, a, that was unique and that was, a, it was atypical. But winning those competitions um, was very helpful. Uh, when I was just about the same age and I won the BMI, uh, excuse me, uh, I won the New York Youth Symphony's first music uh, prize. Uh, I think it was first music 14 at the time. Um, and now they're up to, I don't know how many, they're up to uh, 35 or more. So that came with a commission, you know, at age 27 to have a piece premiered by the New York Youth Symphony at Carnegie Hall. So that, you know, that's, that was, again, a very coveted thing that um, was extremely helpful. And I think I was somewhat unusual in that I already had had at least a couple fully professional orchestral performances even before that, but that helped. Um, but what I have done and continue to do <laughs> all this time is I devote a significant amount of time in any given week or month or year to promotion. And so I have done a lot of promotional work to get my music in front of orchestras. And that means not only conductors who conduct orchestras, but executive directors who run orchestras, artistic administrators who help program music for orchestras, marketing people who market and come up with ideas for orchestras, uh, you know, development people. Um, I have spent a lot of time trying to put my music in front of the orchestral community since I was young. Um, and, and I still continue to do it. I do promotional mailings, um, uh, you know, I do emailings, um, I do any number of things. Um, and I'm fortunate now and, and for the last number of years to have 
a publishing agent, uh, Bill Holub of Bill Holub Music in New York, who represents the catalogs of about 25 or so busy self-published composers. So, you know, he's got um, folks like uh, Kevin Putz, Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, and more recently, Michael Doherty and uh, Michael Torkey and uh, Kenneth Fuchs just went to him. So he handles the rentals, um, but he doesn't do promotion. So he's not out there promoting things. He's handling the the actual rental requests when, once they come in. So I, you know, I think to a certain extent, promoting, it just has to become it's part of your job. So you can't just say, okay, I'm not going to promote anything for the next six months. I'm going to write a piece. And when I'm done with this for six months, I'm going to get back on the promotion train. It has to be both. And, and when I have a commission and when I have to write, what tends to happen is as we get closer to the deadline, I spend more and more time writing and less and less time promoting and dealing with the, the business part, especially when we get really close and I just have to get the thing done. But then once it's done, I tend to then sort of balance it out and then I'll do a bunch more promotion and then and spend less time writing. Um, so, you know, that's, again, that's, uh, that's part of it. There's a lot more to it than that, but that is because I've been so passionate about the orchestral world, as opposed to, let's say the chamber music world or the choral music world or the musical theater world. Um, I have devoted a lot of my life to trying to establish and maintain relationships with people who are in orchestras. As you mentioned, uh, the the work and your early experience what stands out to me in your first orchestral production the requiem uh, what an immense amount of work that took amount of discipline what a credit that is for a young person who uh, i think back to my age i was uh, not disciplined to that degree it really speaks highly of the the discipline and focus it takes talent of course and it also takes diligence and effort and that's been evidence from the beginning and one of my favorite quotes, you may know it, it's from Mozart. I have a book of quotes, and this one has stuck out to me. I'm going to loosely paraphrase, you may already know it. But right. Mozart, who we think of as the uh, semi-divine who goes to the mountain peak and just absorbs the music of the heavens right. into his powdered you know, wig and is just emanating music. He had a quote in his life that's roughly, everybody thinks this comes easily to me. I work harder than anyone. And right. he worked immensely hard. And all of the music that we honor as this has gone before, the vast majority of it is a result of the similar kind of investment of talent and work. And and I thought in, in our email exchange, you had noted work. And I, it's a thread I wanted to pull because for someone who doesn't understand that side of it, it may seem like these works just appear uh, out of nowhere. I was enjoying your symphony just the other day as I was... I'm looking forward to speaking with you. And you mentioned the third movement and it stands out to me. I remember it was going through my head when you were talking about it, but we experience it as listeners at that moment, not knowing the massive amount of work it takes to bring those sound waves to our ears. And I, I like to just call that out for folks who aren't aware of what that takes. So right. hats and off to you for that. <laughs> yes. I mean, it requires immense dedication. Um, you know, immense tenacity. I mean, that, that's a word that has been applied to me in certain things that I've read as tenacity. And I, I guess that, I guess that's true. Uh, that it requires, you know, <clears throat> it requires an almost obsessive degree of focus, um, you know, and it can of course have uh, difficulties. I mean, you know, it's not um, the kind of lifestyle that many people enjoy in terms of, you know, the kind of overused phrase work-life balance, right? I mean, so uh, it's pretty hard to have traditional work-life balance when your work is your life, um, when when this is what you do all the time. I mean, kind of, you know, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, there are, there are certain, you know, sacrifices that have to be made, uh, at least for me, uh, you know, in terms of knowing what kind of effort it's going to take to do these things. And yes, the, you know, the payoffs can be very, very special. They can be a kind of payoff that very few people get to enjoy in this world, um, if you know if that is something that you would desire, and it is something that I desire. So those payoffs, you know, they can be the result of literally thousands of hours of work uh, for a payoff that lasts in time a very short amount of time. But they're so special when they happen that they, uh, you know, that they they burn themselves into your psyche, and you know, and you and you remember them and. You know, going back to, you know, the phrase of difficulty and work, I, I mean, I can't tell you how hard it can be to write compelling music that actually works. Um, it can be extraordinarily difficult. 
And you know, we can we composers can get to a certain point with material um, where we feel like you know everything from point A to point B or C works really well, and we simply cannot figure out how to get to point D, right? And we try 16 different things, and none of them seems to work. You know, and then we have to go away and come back and 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 figure it out, and it could take forever, uh, seemingly forever, to then kind of get past that particular difficulty and move on. And then you go, oh well, now I've got to point D, but I have to get all the way to point Z. So I have I have all all of this uh, additional work to do. And I think that the, I think that there are composers in this world for whom the process creatively is easier than others. Um, and I think for me, probably. Uh, it's on the more difficult side that I, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't talk to lots of other professional composers on a regular basis and compare notes, but I do think that some people, perhaps the notes simply come more easily to them. You know, they have greater facility. If you look at how much music certain people have written, you know, contemporaries, if you will, um, you say, oh, wow, you know, there's, there's a lot more music than I have written. Um, you know, so that, that just reflects an individual personality. What I will say is, you know, so even let's say my catalog is relatively small, you know, 24, 25 pieces instead of a hundred pieces, but almost all of it <clears throat> is actively performed. Um, and to me, that is a kind of indication that, okay, that, you know, on some level, what I'm doing is working, <laughs> even though it can be excruciating because, you know, even things that I, that I wrote 20 years ago when I was 30, 31 years old, like, holy moly, they're still getting played all the time, right? Um, and so that's a kind of validation of the work that has been put into it. And I also think it, it to some extent, it actually gets harder as time goes by because you've written more music. You'd think it would be easier, but in fact, you know, uh, you, know you've, you don't want to repeat yourself you don't want to just do what you've done. And we do have, I think, certain innate tendencies, you know, especially if we're keyboard players, which, which I am, um, you know, our fingers tend to do similar things. And so, um, you know, the way your hand lays on the keyboard may in fact um, suggest to you a certain way of, of coming up with a melody that would be different if you were a trumpet player or something. And I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a wind or a brass player. So, so the fact that I'm a keyboard player um, that also, you know, in a sense, is a limitation that I have to try to get over. Anyway, all, all of this is is part of that, um, you know, being a professional composer. But again, the payoffs can be, they can be extraordinarily special when they happen. We should also talk about recordings, just in general. <laughs> talk about recording. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, touch on that. And my, my thought is uh, that we will go through what you would want an audience member or someone who encounters your music to know coming into it. As I went through your catalog, I've been enjoying it. I found it on Apple Music. It's uh, through all the major channels. It's relatively straightforward to find on your website, propulsivemusic.com. We'll have links in the show. But being prepared to encounter your music, what is there anything you would want someone to know or to have in their mind as they approach your music so they can experience it the way you would intend them to? And I think then that feel free to talk about recordings too because that is a dislocation in time from the production the human production of this thing and the human right. experience of it right um yeah i mean it's an interesting question in terms of preparation if you will um and it, you know i think to a large extent this depends on the on the individual person the individual audience member you mentioned in your earlier comments about uh Classical music in general, you know, for lack of a better term, let's call it classical music, um, being to some people having a kind of forbidding quality to it uh, in some way. And, as, you know, I don't, I certainly don't feel that about my own music. Um, I mean, I feel that my music is pretty easily digested and pretty, pretty easily comprehended, even if it was quite difficult to create. Um, you know, musical style is is a hugely complicated topic and obviously we live in a world in which many different kinds of composers with many different kinds of backgrounds and tastes are creating many different kinds of music um i think happily you know we have lived through and come out the other side of a time in which uh to be forbidding and wildly esoteric um, is not necessarily <laughs> the goal anymore um you know i mean i among other things part of it in my, my teaching, you know, I teach a course on 20th century music. And as you very well know, I mean, repertoire from a certain period, you know, from the post-World War II and the 50s and the 60s and even the early 70s, I mean, a lot of the kinds of things 
that uh, so-called mainstream composers were doing, the kinds of things that were being rewarded with performances and prizes and commissions and all of that, um, is music that was you know, extraordinarily difficult for most audience members to relate to. And um, that's not necessarily a, a denigration of it as much as it is a description of a lot, a lot of that music. It's an oversimplification, but there's truth in that. There, there was a lot of really difficult repertoire. Um, and you know, we think of, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, as you know, if you've looked at uh, things of mine, of Leonard Bernstein, who was deeply influential on my life, even though I, I never met him. And uh, he continues to, his legacy continues to inform my thought to a great extent. And, you know, there are recordings of him during his music directorship of the New York Philharmonic in the 1960s, in which you hear him valiantly attempting to convey to an audience that the, you know, the complexity, the way into this music that he was about to perform, that he felt so compelled to perform, and even something like John Cage, Atlas Eclipticalis, and to hear Bernstein's efforts to explain Atlas Eclipticalis to an audience of the New York Philharmonic, and then to hear the reactions and the boos and all that. Um, you know, so my point in mentioning this is that this that's not my music. Um, so my music is pretty easily understood and digested. And of course, I have... Um, I certainly have written a fair amount of music that also has text in some way. And, you know, because of the success of, of Ellis Island, The Dream of America, that has, you know, by far my most uh, well-known piece. And because that piece uses spoken word and orchestra, that's a very specific kind of thing, right? That's in a way that's quite a different, uh, you know, quite a different animal than purely orchestral. When you have spoken word and orchestra, it's a rather different thing. But because those are stories and those are stories of you know, real Ellis Island immigrants from uh, you know, 30 year span telling their own stories, then that's, a, that's an even more easily understood thing because people respond to the spoken language and they understand the stories and the stories are compelling. And my music is there to help enhance the emotional aspect of that. But even purely instrumental music, um, you know, I seek to write music that I myself will enjoy listening to. <laughs> so, and that's hard. Uh, you know, it's hard to write something that I myself am satisfied with. And, and all I can say is, you know, having done this for a while, that if at the end of the day, I am satisfied with the piece that I've written, probably other people will be too, because I have, I've rejected so much stuff along the way um, that, um, you know, that in general, and, and unless your tastes are very different, I mean, unless you have a thing against, you know, tonal harmony and, you know, and, and melodic music, if, that, if that's not your thing, then you, then you probably won't like it. Uh, but, you know, for the, for the general audience, you know, people who have very little connection to classical music, who have a, a passing relationship at best, I have often found that those people in the concert hall respond very well to, to my music. And even though it's not been my sort of goal per se, I can't tell you how many times audience members have come up to me after performances of many pieces, especially Ellis Island, but many others, and, and have said some version of the following. You know, I really don't like contemporary music at all. <laughs> and I, you know, I, something like, you know, I was kind of scared to hear your piece or whatever, but boy, I love your piece. You know, I've heard some version of that a lot. And I haven't set out as my goal to make that happen, but in a way it's just kind of organic, um, I think, to, to the nature of my piece. So I, I don't think it requires um, a, any special degree of preparation. I mean, part of what we have to do as composers, I think, is try to craft music that will connect with people the first time. Um, if they can go back a second and a third and a fourth time, and if they can not only enjoy it, but maybe hear something they hadn't heard before, that's all the better. But you know, we don't we don't really have the luxury of people sitting in a concert hall hearing your piece three times. I mean, they're going to hear it once, and uh, so I think you you have to connect with them. You have to grab them, and that's hard to do. But if we can do it well, then I, I think it's it's really satisfying. So as you talk about that, um, and I say accessibility advisedly because from our period of training when we intersected there was still the hangover of, of hypermodernism in music and there was almost a stigma uh, on being direct and overt and, and, and your music is very winsome and it is intended to be understood. It's not evasive is the way sometimes modern music almost intended to evade the listener and challenge the listener. You invite the listener into that experience and you mentioned the concert hall which is an interesting problem and I'll frame it this way. The reality of human 
uh, psychology, something that I've spent some time thinking about as it relates to art and music. We love what we already know. And there is this reality that we don't transcend our humanness in that sense. And so when we hear something that's familiar to something we know, it's easier to connect to. And in a concert hall, you get one chance. It's so hard to even get a single performance. You have to really win somebody's heart and mind in that moment. But then there's this whole world of recording. And I sometimes curse, shake my fist in the air at Thomas Edison that we have recordings because music in that sense has changed a lot of the art that you work in and the whole history of the Beethovens and the Mozarts who had no such thing. And now we have, uh, at a click, you can have 50 of the greatest performances of Beethoven in any variation you could ever want. And that's the recorded, the glut of recording opportunity. But for a composer, it's your vehicle to touch more listeners than you could possibly do in a concert hall. And it's a critical part of your voice being heard. So talk about how you approach it, what it takes to bring these recordings to life. You've had some of the world's finest players record and memorialize your music, which is a beautiful gift. Just talk about that a little bit. Sure. It's a, you know, it's a big aspect, I think, of, of being a composer and the, the larger question of the recordings versus the live experience. I mean, that's a that's something that many, many people in the, in the world of music, not only classical music, but especially classical music, grapple with uh, on a regular basis, uh, particularly since recording technology has become so sophisticated and, uh, you know, and even orchestral sample libraries, which is another whole topic that, you know, we'll save for another day. But, you know, that that has transformed the nature of what it means to write for orchestra uh, as a composer. and. Uh, you know, I think recordings in general are immensely important. Um, and certainly my own knowledge of and, and appreciation for classical music in general would not have been what it became and what it is if it weren't for <clears throat> all of the recordings um, that I've spent so much time listening to. And I showed you earlier uh, just a couple of little photo snapshots of my studio and you see my my custom built, you know, compact disc collection case that has like 3000 CDs, which is not even all of them. Um, so I've spent a lot of time uh, acquiring and listening to recordings. And I realized <clears throat> very early, very early on, I'm not, you know, at this point, more than 20 years ago, when I was just getting started as a composer, uh, that recordings were going to be immensely important. Uh, and in fact, that that has proven very true. So I have had the good fortune at this point to do three full-length commercial recordings. We'll call them albums, and even though uh, it's kind of an old-fashioned word, albums. So I've done my first one with the London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road, uh, my second one with the Philharmonia at Air Studios, which was the orchestral tracks for Ellis Island, The Dream of America, and then my third one with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, also back at Abbey Road, and two of those three have been on, on Noxos. So <clears throat> I've been very fortunate to have these three recordings um, that you know, each roughly, you know, more or less an hour worth of music and conducted by me um, and recorded uh, in, in these world-class studios with these incredibly great world-class players. Uh, and I will say as kind of a tease to the future that I'm, I'm very far along in planning a fourth uh, and uh, things are not yet solidified, so I can't um, give details yet, but it will uh, once again be one of the great London orchestras that will do this. Uh, and hopefully this will be coming, you know, within the next number of months. Um, so these things are immensely important. They're also, of course, um, extremely expensive to do, but they represent such important milestones for a composer. And um, my first recording with, with the London Symphony in 2001, when I, I was just uh, 31 years old, not quite 31 years old, to get to stand, you know, in front of the LSO at that age uh, for two days and and make a recording of six of my pieces, uh, you know, at age 31 was was absolutely astonishing and really it launched things for me in many ways. Um, and and that these are all long stories, but that that one uh, did have some private sponsorship attached to it, uh, for which I'm grateful. The second and third recordings um, were essentially entirely funded by me, um, and so. I have from just kind of getting back, tying it in a little bit to your early question, earlier question about the business aspect of it. Um, I have always tried to think long term and think investment. And so these are extremely expensive projects, right? Um, it's like buying a luxury car. It's a very expensive thing to do, but it's a 
it's an investment. It's a business investment and it's a career investment. It's a multi-year investment um, that will ultimately, I believe, pay off if, you know, if things go well and if the music is good, which we assume it is, et cetera. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not easy to do. They take a long time. It takes a long time to A, to have enough music to record a full album and B, to have enough money to pay for the thing to record the, the full album. But what I have discovered <clears throat> very pleasantly over the years is that um, it has allowed me to connect, just sort of say what you said a minute ago, with a much, much larger audience than I ever could do just, just with my pieces being performed in the concert hall. And I, I consider myself very fortunate that the entire American classical radio community has embraced my music to a degree that I would not have expected. Um, I'm very grateful for that, and uh, I don't take it for granted by any means. But there have been tens of thousands of broadcasts of my music uh, on classical radio. Um, and uh, you know, I know that from, from BMI statements and, and, and from other sources about how much there has been. And it also has allowed me to interact with um, a very cool group of people, which are the people who actually program that music, uh, you know, classical radio hosts and producers who are inevitably, in my experience, without exception, a, a really cool group of people <laughs> who are so interesting and, and you know, very passionate about this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of them um, who have become kind of friends who are interested in this and that, who I know will be interested in whenever the next you know, album or my, my orchestral music can be released, there's a, there's a bunch of people who will be very eager to, um, to embrace that music. So that has also led to just all kinds of serendipitous connections and performances. Um, and so even though those recordings are, are you know, they're fixed in time <clears throat> and, and it's that moment, it's not the same as a live experience, um, it's still an extraordinarily important thing. And I, I don't think I've yet used the word legacy, but I think you know, to, to the extent that one thinks about one's legacy, I mean, we're only here for so long, we're only active for so long, um, you know, and then we're gone. And that is the nature of, of human beings. But recordings have the potential to outlast us. Um, and so you know, we think about, uh, I mean, what, what's, what's one of the earliest things we could think about? You know, Mahler's piano rolls, right? I mean, now that's a complicated thing, but when you think about the fact that Mahler set down a couple of these piano rolls in his lifetime and that with the right means of reproduction, we can get a sense of how Mahler played the piano. I mean, that's incredibly valuable, right? That's an unbelievably valuable thing. Um, or, you know, or, or, or Elgar and you know, these very early recordings at, at the beginning of Abbey Road or any number of others. So to have an opportunity to be even a tiny little part of that larger recorded legacy and say, okay, this was the best that I could make it at that point in time. And here it is. And, you know, and uh, if I'm hit by a bus tomorrow, to use that proverbial phrase, the recordings are still going to be here. Um, so I think that's very important as well. So I've considered these things to be among the most uh, significant things that I've worked towards in my career. And I certainly am very much looking forward to number four, whenever I can make this happen. Well, we'll be very excited to hear when that comes out and uh, not just me, but many people will look forward to that. And um, if and when the time is right and you wanna come back and, and talk some more about that journey and that uh, release, uh, we'd be honored to, to celebrate that with you. You have an impressive discography there's another legacy term for us right and uh and a legacy that that is uh having is touching a lot of people in Thanks. its way and that's a beautiful thing to, for the world it's a great gift and your hard work is appreciated uh by more people than who can tell you that so uh Thanks. always good to be encouraged when those lonely days in the studio where you're hacking out another note to remember that Lives are touched in ways you'll never see, but are touched nonetheless. So really appreciate your work, your creative output, your diligence, your doggedness, and what it takes to bring your art to the world. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I will share with the listeners again a little more how to find you, but propulsivemusic.com is a great gateway to learn more yes. about your projects, your work, and your discography. Your music's available through all the streaming channels, very easily discovered. Um, 
and well, I'll encourage everybody listening to this program to listen. I didn't want to take time on the show to hear those things. Go listen, download them, pay for the downloads because <laughs> this mo- this money needs to flow to the person who created it, and that's right and as it should be. So buy this music, um, pay for the music, even though that's not what people do anymore. Pay for this music so there can be more of it and reward this work. Peter, it's been an honor and a real pleasure connecting with you and hearing more about your process. Thank you for being with thank me. You. Thank you, Gustav. It's very nice to, to reconnect after all this time. And uh, I hope that your listeners will enjoy our chat. I certainly did. Uh, I know they will. And uh, best of success on your upcoming projects. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing them hit the public waves when they're ready. Absolutely. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Thanks for joining me for this special interview with composer Peter Boyer. I hope you enjoyed getting to know him and a little more about the inspiration behind his fantastic music. Again, encourage you to check out his website, propulsivemusic.com, and you can do a Google search on Peter Boyer. You'll certainly find him. Uh, One of our eminent composers uh, living in America today, and I hope you enjoyed that conversation. As always, I invite you to let me know what you enjoyed about today's show or any of the shows that you hear. Help me craft this and send it in a direction that enriches your life. I love to share the orchestral music tradition in all of its many forms uh, in the modern day. And again, thank you for joining me on that journey. See you next time.